Welcome to my Learning Everything About Frostpunk video guide series. The goal of this video series is to provide all of the relevant information necessary to help beginners and intermediate players alike become knowledgeable about all of the game's mechanics. I'm talking everything. Welcome to episode one. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the citizens, the different icons in the game, the game over mechanics, a little bit about the laws, and we'll mention the difficulties in the game. So, that's what we're going to be doing here. Let's go ahead and start off by describing the different types of citizens you have available to work for you in Frostpunk. This is your workforce, and you can see it by hovering your mouse over the right-hand lower corner icon here, which shows the number of citizens in your city. The first on the list is the workers, the second is engineers, the third is children, the fourth is automatons and below that we'll have uh, icons that we'll talk about later on in the video series. Now your workforce is integral to your city surviving as they are needed to employ the various buildings within your city. Most buildings in the game like the cookhouse, the coal mine, steelworks, things like this, a good, a good 70 80 percent of the structures can be employed by anyone assuming this, the appropriate laws are passed uh, but yeah they can be employed by workers engineers children etc uh, there are however certain buildings which can only be employed by certain citizens and I'd like to clarify that list as one of the first things that we do here so infirmaries and medical posts can only be employed by engineers workers cannot work here children cannot work here only engineers Likewise, on the opposite end of the spectrum, hunters' huts and hunters' hangers can only be employed by workers. Engineers and children cannot hunt. If you're playing on a game mode that allows scouts and outpost teams, only workers can be employed as scouts. Unless you're playing on the scenario called the Arcs, in which uh, there's a little bit of a difference that we're going to talk about later. but. Rule of thumb, only workers can become scouts or outpost teams. There's another structure called the factory that can only be employed by engineers or automatons. In the purpose law trees, there are specific buildings like the propaganda center, which can only be employed by engineers. Likewise, the guard stations, watchtowers, and faith keepers buildings can only be employed by workers and engineers. Children cannot be employed and automatons cannot be employed. Now at the beginning of the game, children are not allowed to work. You can, however, pass the child labor safe jobs to allow them to work in a few different buildings, and safe jobs includes the cookhouse, the hothouse, the industrial hothouse, actual resource piles, and gathering posts. Those are the five workplaces that are considered safe jobs for children. Now you can go on later on to pass all jobs and that will allow them to work in all of the coal, steel, wood, and other related type buildings. Uh, but for the most part children are limited but can be made functional using those laws. Uh, and those are the uh, citizen specific type buildings. Uh, everything else can be pretty much employed by anyone like the cookhouse, uh, wall drills, coal mines, and we'll discuss these building types in the next episode. Episode 2 is going to cover all of the different structures in the entire game, and we will get to that. Uh, but yes, that's, uh, those are the limitations you'll be faced with, and you will learn as you play along in this game who can work where. Uh, yeah. Next on our list, I'm going to talk about all the various symbols that you see during the game. That includes all of these things up here at the top of the screen and all these symbols you see down here at the bottom of the screen. So let's go ahead and talk about the first symbol in the game, and that is this. This is coal. I have enough coal to last me four months. You're going to need a lot of coal. It keeps this thing running. It's called the generator. It keeps your people warm, happy, and alive. Don't have coal, then you don't have heat. You don't have heat, you don't have... Uh, living people anymore and well your game just ends at that point so you're gonna need some coal to survive we'll talk about how to gather that in a later episode the next resource is wood and that goes along with steel wood and steel 
are how you upgrade your structures, build structures, do research, etc. You get steel from the steelworks, you get wood from sawmills and wall drills. We'll talk about that in the next episode in more depth when we go over all of the different structures. You're going to need wood and steel to basically grow your city to whatever you would like. The next fourth symbol you see up here at the top of the screen is called a steam core. Now steam cores are, uh, I'd call them advanced construction materials. They're used to create some of the more advanced structures like advanced coal mine advanced wall drill or even like the factory they're also used to build automatons giant robots you're gonna need a lot of these and you won't get a lot of them so you're gonna have to use them well carefully efficiently and yeah steam cores are your most valuable resource use them well next resource on the list is raw food you'll be collecting raw food at either the hothouses where you can grow them or at hunter hangers where you can go out and find them. You will bring back raw food to your city and people can eat raw food when they're hungry but they would prefer to eat food rations which uh, increases your food efficiency by quite a bit and allows people to eat actually healthy food. Typically you will make four food rations out of two raw food. So the conversion rate is worth doing even if you really didn't care about it. We'll talk more about this in the episode about food, which is going to be a little bit later. Next uh, icon on the list up here is called prosthesis. Now these are to deal with amputations, and you won't be dealing with this until far later in the game. You will, however, have to deal with them eventually. But we're just going to mention what that symbol is, and that 100 is the max you can carry it in your... Uh, resource pile. The last symbol is only unlocked if you pass one of two different laws, and I'm not going to mention what those laws are quite yet, but this is the amount of dead bodies you have available for use in your city. Yes, you can use dead bodies in this city. I'm not going to spoil how quite yet, but it is possible. Alright, let's talk about these symbols at the bottom, because these are going to be the symbols that you need to know about the most. These are the six symbols that can appear. You have red ones on top, gray ones on bottom. Red ones are the ones that need to be dealt with immediately. These are the big ones. So let's talk about what they are. You can hover your mouse over it and it'll tell you exactly what they are. Uh, the house red symbol is how many homeless people you have. That's people without homes. Having no home is bad. And we'll talk about the negative effects about that in a later episode. This symbol, the knife and the fork symbol, is people are hungry and or starving in your city. You don't want hungry people. That's bad. If they're hungry for too long, they'll become starving. If they're starving for too long, they'll just die. This red plus symbol signifies how many sick people you have and how many gravely ill people you have. If people are sick for too long, they will become gravely ill. If they're gravely ill too long, they will die. That's bad. You need to deal with all these problems as they occur or you're gonna have a bad time. As for hungry versus starving, the hungry will appear on top, starving will appear on bottom. For the sick, regular sick will appear on top, gravely ill will appear on the bottom right here. You can see these two numbers stacked. That's what the three red symbols do. On the bottom, the peg symbol is the signal for how many people are amputees in your city. It's a wooden peg looking symbol. This gray cross symbol is how many people are being treated at the moment. Uh, this is a good one to have as it means the sick people are not here, they're down here being treated. So that's a good thing to have. For the most part, these gray symbols are problems being dealt with. However, this other gray symbol, 39, here, is of a gray snowflake. This is how many people are in a freezing environment. Freezing is bad, and we will discuss this more in the heating episode. But if you have this symbol, you need to get the people out of that freezing environment immediately. Whether they're working in there or they are homeless, you will need to deal with that problem, or you're going to have a real bad time. All right, so that is all the symbols in the game. We're going to now talk about the game over conditions of this game, basically. How can you lose? Well, you can lose. The easiest way is by having your overdrive on and allowing your overdrive to hit maximum. And if I speed up the game, you'll notice that this is at 3%, 4%. 
uh, 5%, and if that hits 100%, well, you're going to have a bad time, and I'll show you what that's going to look like. Let me just get rid of this real quick, blah, blah, blah. All right, so if your generator explodes, your game is over. Another way to lose is if your hope hits zero, you'll be given an ultimatum. If you do not raise your hope, you will be banished. Likewise, if your discontent reaches 100%, you will be given an ultimatum. If you do not lower your discontent, you will be either banished or executed, depending on how far down the purpose law trees you have gone. There are a couple of other more difficult to get uh, game overs, and one of them is if you only have children left in your city. If you do, you will be banished by the children. Well, they'll actually make you work in the coal mines, but you'll have to do that to see that one yourself, or I might show it to you eventually. If you also have only amputees remaining in your city, they will banish you, and you'll be kicked out. Game over. If you have no one left in your city, like everybody's dead, well, the game's over that way too. Uh, there are also other scenarios, like the Arks and the Refugees and the Fall of Winter Home, that all provide their own set of defeat conditions, and uh, each of those are a little bit different, and it really depends on which one you're playing. So, those are some of the ways that you can lose the game, and you really don't want to have that happen. So, um, let's go ahead and just do a quick overview of the Law Tree, and I'm going to show you what this is all about. When you first start the game, you're going to have what's called the Adaptation Law Tree. Now, each of these, this looks a little bit messy, but I promise you it's clean, because if you look at each of these branches reaching out of the middle here, each of these represents a different aspect of the game. This tree up here is the work shift branch. It deals with emergency shifts and extended shifts. This over here is the tree that deals with children and how you want them to function within your city. This tree down here is how you want to deal with the dead, the dead in your city, whether you want to be a little bit nice about it or not so nice. The bottom tree, the bottom branch, is dealing with all the medical situations within your city and uh, ways to deal with some of the more pressing matters that may arise. This branch over here is how to deal with uh, the food situation in your city. Pretty short branch. And this tree over here with five laws on it is dealing with the discontent in your city. So we've got work shifts, children, death, medical, food, and discontent. And each of these branches will allow you to deal with the situations that occur in your city more effectively. The more laws you pass, the more effectively you can deal with the problem that you're having. However, every law does have its uh, <clears throat> side effects. But we'll get to that in a future episode. Uh, one of the last things I'd like to discuss is the fact that we have different difficulties within the game. And I'm going to discuss what those difficulties are. Uh, we'll do that in just a moment, though. I'd like to show you exactly what it is that you're trying to avoid while playing Frostpunk. And that is what happens if your generator this big old honking thing hits 100%, so we're just gonna let that happen so I can show you why it's bad. This is what's gonna happen. And we are going to do our best in this series to provide you all with the tools and knowledge necessary to avoid having this happen to you. And in that regard, I'd like to make a suggestion in the Difficulties tab. And let's go ahead and discuss that as the last thing on our list here. Frostpunk has four difficulties, easy, medium, hard, and extreme. And depending on where you set this slider on your game selection, uh, you'll have an easier time or a harder time. My recommendation for people who want to learn the game is to set people's needs in weather to medium, economy to easy, and society's attitude to extreme. People's needs basically deals with how quickly people become sick and hungry. Economy deals with how quickly you do research, how fast you gather resources, and how many items are out in the frostlands for you to gather. 
Weather is just uh, how severe the mini storms are and how long cold snaps last. Society attitude is how uh, prone people are to optimism and pessimism. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, having people's needs and weather on the basic default settings, it helps you learn how to play the game at the intended pace. But having the economy set to easy gives you the tools and resources needed to solve problems. Society's attitude at the worst makes those problems happen more often, but you have the tools to deal with it, so you learn how to play very, very quickly. This is my suggestion. Of course, you are more than welcome to play however you'd like, and that's pretty much it for this first episode. Uh, play at the difficulty you'd like, and learn how to play the game the hell you like. Next episode, episode two, we're going to be talking about all of the different structures within Frostpunk. I'm going to list every single one. I'm going to show them all to you. And I'm going to tell you what they do. Hope you all look forward to that episode. I'll see you in a little bit. Bye.